Today we explore every angle of Star Trek Strange New Worlds Incredible Season 2 finale and I go on an away mission to discover the secrets behind some of the terrifying animatronics and puppets that haunted the crew of the Enterprise this season. Cobble together a Gorn trap and meet me in the ready room for all this and more. Hey nerds, I'm Will Wheaton, and this is The Ready Room, your official behind-the-scenes hub for all things Star Trek Universe. In this week's episode, the Gorn are back in a big way. But if my mentioning the Gorn only makes you think of that awesome rubber suit from 1967, I'm going to call for a red alert! Just like Nurse Chapel giving vaccines to a human colony, I'm here to inoculate you from spoilers. So if you haven't seen the pulse-pounding season finale titled Hegemony, recalibrate your sensors, stream it, and return here for a full mission briefing. This week's season finale features a whole bunch of Gorn. Would it be a gaggle of Gorn? Maybe we could call it a Gorn field? The talented artists at the practical special effects studio Legacy Effects produced the Gorn and several more of our favorite Star Trek creatures. I recently went on an away mission to Legacy Effects Studio where I visited with co-founder and owner J. Allen Scott and learned about his company's contributions to Star Trek over the years. The final episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds second season is one of the most cinematic yet. It is emotional, it is terrifying, and it ends with a high stakes cliffhanger worthy of a Star Trek finale. Oh, and just in case all of that doesn't land it in your personal top 10, Scotty, being like maximum Scotty, are you kidding me? Control room, engage. You're having issues with comms? Mine just went out. Let me check with Cayuga. Count the bridge, you read? I'm reading a bogey, nine o'clock. The finale is a very dark, very, you know, like driving action-oriented episode. Gorn protocols to be distributed upon an encounter with the hostile species. Breaking case of Gorn. Ortegas finally goes to a planet. I've been asking for this as Ortegas and as Melissa. I'm like, what's about to happen? We needed to rationalize this as um, a colony on a colony planet. So we began to bring in Federation dressing. We were trying to tech it up a little bit, but also it was supposed to, you know, reference like a simpler time. And so this colony came down and had chosen this aesthetic. Then we tore all this to pieces, covered everything in blood, had scorched and burnt things. We drove a vehicle into a shop, set it on fire. That back lot was dressed for a post-Gorn battle. So everywhere you turned, you were in the scene. La'an is very composed this time round. And when she does go onto the planet and she kills the first Gorn youngling, she gains power, I think, over the Gorn. <laughs> The new phase of settings what? For Mbenga, it's about making sure he can support Pike, he can help save Chapel, help save Battelle, and fight the Gorn. Maybe instead of finding a way to fight them, we, we find some way to reach them. Pike's initial approach to the Gorn is to assume that there is an intrinsic set of ethics to any given sentient life form. This one, however, seems to be the one he's running into like a brick wall because they do not adhere to that at all. They're highly developed, highly intelligent, and yet a vicious, predatory species without anything that we would refer to as ethics. You're not gone. Obviously. You shouldn't have walked into my gun trap then. It was clear there was a, I'm gonna say an engineer-sized hole right in the middle of the story. I needed a scientist. I needed somebody who might have an interesting solution to this problem with the Gorn. But I'm a man of Montgomery Scott at your service. 
the thing about bringing original series characters back, we always knew we were going to get there over time. But you, you have to deliver it in a way that's really satisfying because there's so much expectation about all these characters. What I liked about the Gorn was that they were monsters. But it turns out they're really hard to do. Bring his neck fast. Like, hey, give him some speed when he, when he swivels his head. That, like that, yeah. We were just in a murderous rage all the time about the little Gorn. You know, we're trying to pop it and we're replacing it with CG, and then we're like going, making it, making it darker, putting it in the mask. You know, and you sort of long for the guy in the suit that Kirk was fighting on the planet. And then, while we're having a murderous rage, the, we start to see the big Gorn, and we're like, oh, oh yeah. Now I like the Gorn again. Any idea what that is? In order to destroy this machine on Parnassus Beta, Spock has to perform like a very crazy mission to the Cayuga in an EV suit. And on the ship is a Gorn. So the zero gravity fight between Spock and Chapel and the Gorn was hugely collaborative between stunts, visual effects, our art department to create the destroyed bridge of the Cayuga, and the actual prosthetics team that provided a practical Gorn in an adult suit. This thing is like giant. It's, uh, uh, it is a man in a suit, but it's of course integrated with animatronics and there's ways to cheat a body to make it look inhuman, which Legacy Effects has done in the best way possible. I think the most challenging stunt work that we did this season was in 210 in the finale episode with the Gorn fight in Zero Gravity. For a stunt performer playing the Gorn, you need to be strong. For starters, the suit is massively heavy. Some estimates are close to 100 pounds that you're wearing the entire time that you're performing. Now, Warren's very strong and he's big. He's six foot seven and a half, so He's got the frame to carry it uh, for the adult Gorn, but yeah, you need a fair bit of toughness and just willing to take a few bruises, uh, even just you know just hanging in, in wires to do the zero gravity is, is a real uh, plight. Part of what we traffic in on the show is modernizing the classic ideas that came out of those original Trek shows. And one of my favorites, one of the ones that we hadn't got yet to try, is the two-parter. The colonists in the landing party appear to have been beamed up by the Gorn. Cliffhangers have always been a part of Star Trek, and I'm glad that we get to introduce cliffhangers at the end of our season. I remember looking to Rebecca on the day and being like, I'm sweating. Like, Celia is having a very, like, Celia's anxious right now. Uhura, of course, is anxious, but Celia's having a real uh, tricky moment with this. Sir, do I respond? Orders, Captain. Those storytelling ideas still work. And also, those stories are too big to tell in one episode. In this week's episode, the Enterprise crew meets future chief engineer Montgomery Scott, better known as Scotty, for the first time. In what Star Trek The Next Generation episode does the crew of the Enterprise D also have their first encounter with the legendary miracle worker? A, relics, B, rascals, C, force of nature, or D, homework? Don't boldly go anywhere. Stay tuned for the answer. I love a good Ready Room Away mission, and today's is spectacular. I am with J. Allen Scott at Legacy Effects Studio, the practical effects house that created the Gorn and tons of other amazing Star Trek effects. Thank you so much for being here with Thanks me Thanks for coming today. out. We're really excited to have you guys here. So far, I've only seen this much of your shop, and I just have to keep picking my jaw up off the floor. <laughs> uh, I got kind of close to that adult Gorn back there and was half expecting it to move. <laughs> it's so scary looking. Um, you have done so much stuff for Star Trek uh, over the years. Tell me about legacy effects, okay. and tell me about some of the things that, that we have seen on screen that you created. Well, myself and my three partners, uh, John L Rosengrant, Lindsay McGowan, and um, Shane Mahan, co-founded Legacy Effects about 15 years ago. Okay. We were all with Stan Winston for 20, almost 30 years. Oh, wow. Individually. 
and recently we've started to put our toes more into television. We didn't do a lot of television. We did a lot of features. We did yeah. a lot of commercial work and then just dabbled, but we never had one of those opportunities to have a show, like an anchor show where you did the monster of the week. When we went up for a set visit last season up to the set of Stranger Worlds, I got to see one of those Gorn heads. I was so floored by how legitimately terrifying that piece was. Where do these nightmares originate? <laughs> well, we have a long list of designers and character designers, and every one of us came with uh, growing up with monsters of one sort or another. So the brain trust really comes from our own desires to recreate our childhoods. Mm -hmm. And then it's a huge creative process with the directors and showrunners to hone us in as to what the franchise wants or what the world needs. Um, these things look like little cameras in and forward, which actually is pretty cool. But it's, it's a long history of creating really fun characters. That's what Stan was all about, was building characters. Yeah. And it's just carried through with everything, because when you start thinking about what are you going to do, it's not just a makeup effect. It's like you, you start to realize that these are creatures and civilizations and societies, and there's reasons for this stuff. It's not just like, hey, how do we make them you know, interesting, scary, friendly, comedic, whatever they are. It's like there's anatomy that goes into it. There's reasons that things are what they are. Do you work with the writers on those things or are you given free reign to, we, it, do you bring it back to the table? Oh, we did some work and figured out that we think the Gorn Society is like this. So it's a little bit of both, but yeah. mostly it comes from the writers. It was interesting the first season is like, we just started, you know, being, we call it a shotgun approach. Like, wouldn't this be cool? And yeah. pulling stuff from all over. And then we would do a presentation and part of that presentation would also be like props or wardrobe or the art department. And then we would see what they were bringing to the table was like, oh, this isn't, what we did was completely inappropriate. Yeah. That doesn't fit within the world that they were building for that species. And so then we would go back. So it just became much more important that we get in tune with, you know, the design of the ships and the technology and what do they use and why. You know, it became yeah. a question of why is that? It doesn't really affect anatomy, but sometimes it does. Would you talk a bit about the marriage of these beautiful, practical, very complex puppets with the CG and like sure. how, how you blend these things together to create a seamless creature. Well, it all starts again from the design. And it was interesting with the Gorn because the very first times that you see them, they are hatchlings yeah. and then the younglings. And we all had discussions with the creatives. It's like, well, that may be what we're going to be for this episode or this season. Mm -hmm. And we're just teasing as to where the story is going to go with the Gorn. But it's like, we need everything. We, we need their life cycle. We need yeah. how they move from this form to that form. And then when they become adults, it's like, again, the why. It's like, they yeah. want certain things. Obviously, it's got a pedigree with the original series. And you saw the Gorn there. And yeah. we want to upgrade, but hold on to what that was. You have to answer all of those things. So before we could even start designing the hatchlings and the younglings, we had to design the adults. And work backwards. And work backwards. We wow. had to make it all make sense okay. because you can't just design that and then like, oh, maybe it's going to turn into this. It yeah. has to be a conversation. It has to make sense. It has to flow. So you like built an adult and then reverse engineered the adult to, to yep. a baby. This is kind of cool, practical hands-on demonstration of how these puppets are brought to life. You're really freaking me out. Okay, so we have two stages of the Gorn here. Uh, we're gonna start with the terrifying creature that is closest to me, yeah, you. I'm so bummed that you don't name <laughs> your creatures and I feel like your name should be... I'm gonna name you Hank after my friend Hank Green. So I'm just gonna name this puppet Hank. Talk to me about what is going into keeping Hank alive right now. What's happening? Uh, this is a glorified hand puppet. So my wrist and hand are up inside the head, giving the neck all three axis of motion and body gross movement. So it can be high or low, come up from under a table, uh -huh. hide me under the table typically. And I'm holding a, a handle and there's no controls inside the head other than just the gross head movement. Um, Alan then has a radio control, which are all servo driven eye blinks, upper and lower eyelids on both sides, and then the upper lip and the lower lip move, as well as the jaw. And then all three together with rubber teeth so it doesn't hurt anybody. If you went in and bit, it doesn't hurt. So uh, we have here, uh, we, ha we have a hatchling and a youngling, am I right? That's right. 
Okay. We, we made several of the hatchlings, yeah. various incarnations of them. They basically all have the same functionality because they're so small. There's yeah. just these little rod puppets. Oh, look at them nuzzling. It's adorable. Right before it eats, <laughs> right before Hank eats it. And then we made one of the youngling. Yeah. And we made that full body one that you see back there. Yes. That's a full puppet for when we had full body shots of it creeping around corners and yeah. being on the ceiling. Yeah. And uh, we made it modular so that its front legs come off of there and can be attached to this one so that we can see as much of the character as possible. Uh -huh. But most of our work was going to be for insert shots because all of them, they're running and jumping across boxes and ceilings and all over the place. Yeah. So ours were the quieter moments where it would creep around a little bit more of the spooky stuff. One of the things that really grabbed my attention when I first saw the puppet for the adult Gorn uh, up in Toronto were the eyes. The Gorn, his eyes are not spherical, which is a typical animal life form, eye shape. Mm -hmm. They're egg shaped. Okay. which doesn't allow them to rotate in both axes on the same point because the longer axis then would move up and bump into the eyelids and it just doesn't work that way. So the adult Gorn's eyes are just an eyeball inside of an eyeball. So it's a spherical eyeball in the middle and that has a very deep concave lens like you're referring to, which allows when it moves, the light travels through the angles of the resin and you really pick up that it's deep. It's not a surface coat eye, which looks very doll-like and, yeah. and artificial. It has a very deep lifelike organic look to it. And that spherical eye does the um, left-right movements. And then that is housed inside of an egg-shaped longer eye like the adolescent here. And that rotates vertically up and down. So the two separate eyes work together to give up, down, left, right, just like a normal organism would. Let's talk about the uh, hatchling over here, uh, which is like just so cute. Well, on the day, we would actually have one or two more people operating this puppet. No kidding. Yeah, because it's Chris would ideally be doing the body if you drop uh -huh. that arm. And then, and then you can be using the body and move against it, push against it. And then another performer would grab the... Um, would do, do the legs. I do the front ones. You do the back ones. It's kind of like magic <clears throat> watching you guys just take this, yeah. grab these different pieces, and make it all go together. What I always say is like every gag gives itself away eventually. Yeah. So it's really a matter of frames within the shot before you realize like, oh, that's a puppet, or or that's a CG shot. So like that's why we, the mix is great, of trying to come up with. <laughs> uh, the mix of technology is what we embrace. And, you know, you just go as long as you can. I feel like Hank really wants to bite me, and we should probably just let that happen. Uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, God! Oh, I'm dying! I'm full of Gorn eggs! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On my notes, I have all the things that go into making a Gorn believable on screen. Tell me if I'm right. Puppetry, animatronics, the internal workings, the radio controllers, and the puppeteer who was running all of those. And then going into an adult Gorn, mm -hmm. this titanic <laughs> outfit that just from a production standpoint, we have to think about reusability. Yeah. Like how is that gonna break down over the course of production? Is there anything that I missed in putting one of these things together to bring it to the screen? Uh, rehearsals and practice. It's acting. Let's talk it's... about that because no one ever talks about getting the timing out and walking through and working with the crew like before the actors come in and all of that. We always rehearse and rehearse and rehearse as we're building. Yeah. You know, like we start with like the big picture first. It's like, how do we make, make sure that it's going to work? We do a proof of concept. Okay. Stan used to call them garbage bag tests. I we love build that. the alien queen. They needed to prove that the concept works. So they yeah. just threw together a character based on garbage bags. Yeah. And that became our code word for like, oh, let's just, you know, prove a concept. Is this the idea gonna work? In my head, I'm redoing Ripley going, get away from her, you garbage <laughs> bag. Um, so the first thing is like, make sure that what we think we're gonna do is gonna work and it's okay. gonna satisfy them. So we do really simplistic tests and then we share that immediately with productions, like this is what we're thinking, this is where the actor's gonna be, this is where the puppeteers are gonna be. Mm -hmm. And then we film them and then make more advances and then we film them again and we just keep sharing back and forth so that everyone understands what we're gonna bring to the table. Right. And things change, but we practice and rehearse and our team that is building it, as they do the animatronics or do the skins, they, they, they start to realize what the limitations are, mm -hmm. what the strengths are, and it's like, oh, we need more stretch here, we need more bend here. And so we're constantly finessing as we build. 
We're at Rick's workstation. This is the Gorn that scared the crap out of you uh, this week in this episode. Um, tell me uh, what is going on here, and uh, uh, just talk to me about these connections and how it all how it all works. Well, what you're seeing here is the internal uh, mechanical structure of the Gorn, which is normally covered by skin or the or the flight suit. And uh, so it's all aluminum framing that's uh, built around some motors, these uh, electronic motors that are very strong and quiet and uh, much faster and stronger than they were in the past. So mm -hmm. we've made some uh, leaps and bounds with that technology. And inside the head itself are standard uh, hobby servos for remodel airplanes and cars that runs the eyes and the jaw, things like that. And so we uh, have radio controls that we use for model airplanes or boats, cars, whatever you want. Uh -huh. And we use it to run these things. So I'm controlling the neck and uh, head base movements. Yep. Alan's controlling the eye features and another uh, Chris. Chris is off camera uh, controlling the jaw. And there are other lip functions and eyebrows and things that aren't plugged in at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but that's basically what it is. So we have batteries that power this that go through voltage regulators through a circuit board that communicates for us. But it's, it's the um, end result of a ton of work from a great team because we've got great sculptors, digital artists, mechanics, engineers, um, electronics guys who soft, program software, yeah. uh, painters, people who make the skins, the core, everything. So it's a really, there's a lot of people involved in making this. Will you three work together to sort of breathe some life uh, uh, into our friend here? Yeah. When I went up to the to set visit and saw this for the first time, uh, I, I think you handed me this yeah. to like, mm -hmm. sort yeah, of move it. it. And, uh, and I did a terrible job. And uh, I, uh, I, I was, so I was already impressed with what you did, but I was really blown away at the natural biological movement of all of this and how believable it all is. Show me some of the earlier steps of this. Um, so we start with a sculpture, either it's made uh, the traditional way out of clay mm -hmm. or it's a digital sculpture. And either way, we'll scan the, the clay version or we'll have the digital original version. Uh, and that'll be brought in for me. I prefer ZBrush, which is this uh, program up here. Uh -huh. and then. We bring the model in here, we shrink, I take a copy of the skin, we shrink it down slightly, subtract that from the original skin, leaving a thin layer, which is what the rubber skin ends up being. Okay. The inner surface is now gonna be the skull, essentially, or what we call the core. Okay. And then we take that, make a copy, shrink it slightly, subtract that, all digital. Now you have a thin shell of that skull, which is now empty for me to put my motors inside. I feel like we are in the middle of kind of a ramping up toward a paradigm shift in how we do this type, this sort of stuff with 3D printing and modeling and the materials that you have available to you. Am I right? Absolutely. Yeah, you are. Yeah, I think that's, we're already I think that's deep. happening. We're deep into You're that. Deep into it? Yeah. yeah. Like with the eyeballs, it's like, well, we could mm -hmm. never have manufactured an eyeball the way that. Let's grab Rick those and look it. at them closely because they're so <laughs> incredible. So this. Oval eye, as Rich, Rick was describing earlier, yeah. it could pivot this way okay. easily. Yep. But it's like it's gonna, it's an egg, so it's gonna mm -hmm. wobble out and wobble this way, okay. and that doesn't really work. So we started looking at if this was the movement. You know, you got this going up and down, and this one moves side to side, and now you've got both axes, and you've also got this weird, just interesting shape in there. Yeah. That could be a membrane, or it's like a deeper. And these were all printed, so I made several versions of the sclera. Yeah. Some of that are kind of an inverted goat eye. You got this weird star oh, pattern. Yeah, look at so that. so you just, this was a CAD model, very uh -huh. precise on how it keyed in. Then I took it in a ZBrush and I abused it and made it all yeah. wobbly and organic. And then we had people paint them. And, yeah, so we just like, what, what looks the most? And we could pop a different one in as we needed to to try out. Yeah, it's like, well, should, the, should the eye be that way? Should it be moving in there? Uh -huh. And we could get this really tight to it. You know, I hope that there are uh, 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 fan filmmakers at home watching this and taking notes and like, oh, I'm going to steal that. I'm going to do that. This I is so see those. cosplayers and, and you know home hobbyists is like we learn from them all the time. Yeah. Because that's that's one thing I've said for years is like you can't compete with that kind of passion. Right. I was like, and they don't have all the tools that we they have. They don't have this facility. They, they don't have the, the budgets. Box, and they yeah. get creative, and you're like, that's a really good idea. Yeah. Either that's the direct idea, or oh, that made me think of this, and we've got this printer. We could use that for. Yeah. And figure out something new. So I think the last piece we have over here that we can look at is this, the helmet from the EV suit. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, that's the helmet from um, the EV suit. May I suit. touch it? Yeah. It's very expensive. Be careful. I believe <laughs> you. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't expect it to be soft. And this comes over this, this guy's head. This mounts over his head. Yeah, and we've like removed that. pieces from this now that would okay. bolt onto this. All right. 
um, that would bolt up into here. And then this would be covered by this kind of trident shaped covering that goes over the top of the glass. Yep. Well, this is amazing and um, I'm going to steal it. So oh, you want to try it on? Yeah, yeah, I'll, wait, can I really no. try it on? I can actually put it on. I don't know if you'll fit. We could try. It, it's only supposed to go to here and this is where Warren's head was. There we go. But do you think that I'm a Gorn now? Do I, it's do pretty I convincing. Anything? Yeah. <laughs> Would you take us all, metaphorically, to the set? You've built your puppets, you, you've done your rehearsals, you're ready to go, you're on the set. Would you talk us through how you collaborate as a, as a, as a puppeteer and as, as a designer with the director and the actors on the set? When it's working in the best way possible, everyone just reacts to the puppet yeah. or, the, or the character. And then we're on the outside. You know, it's like that old saying is like, if you've done your job right, nobody knows that you did it. Yeah. And that's our goal is like, we are offside. The director directs the, like in this case, director directs Warren. Yeah. And it's like, and we're there listening. We're yeah. right on the outsides making sure, because part of our job is to take care of him the whole time too. But part of that is like, when he hears direction or the next action or the next rigging with stunts or the directors, we're there listening, offering solutions and whatever. But most of the time, for performance stuff, they talk to Warren. When he's inside the suit, can he see out at all? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we made great efforts to make sure that he had vision. Because yeah. I feel, I feel you like just important. can't have a Gorn bumbling around and right. bumping into things. My friend wrote for The Muppets, so I got to go to a taping of The, of the Muppet Show. Yeah. And the Muppeteers, they keep their characters alive between scenes mm -hmm. and they talk to each other and it's hilarious, right? It's just people like goofing off. Yeah. Um, do you do that? Do you keep your time. characters alive? You do, right? All the time. <laughs> yeah, we, we try and save them yeah. because you never know when something's going to go. We're always, you know, it's not like these have been engineered. They're built in like eight, ten weeks. Yeah. So you never know if you're stressing something out to the point where it's got a lifespan. And then you will be like, oh, crap. I was playing with it too much. And now when the scene right. comes up, it's we were having such great enough. banter. <laughs> I told you before, never talk to me at work. I'm busy. <laughs> but when, once you start to get a confidence of it, you start to play with it because you need to know what it is. So it's like, I would always be moving the head and Rick would always be moving the, the uh, mouth and eyes of the Gorn because yeah. like it's rehearsal. Yeah. So we're rehearsing in between. And so while the director's giving Warren direction, we'd be moving the head and nodding and looking over. And yeah. it's like, well, you make it as much conversational and as you know natural as possible, just like the other actors are. It's like, when they're talking amongst themselves, you just do what you would normally do. And that gives you more time, we call it like more time on the sticks, where it's like, it's just practice. Mm -hmm. So, cause you don't get that much. And the more that you play with it, it also makes the actors more, you know, familiar with what the creature is too. Have you had that experience of an actor like forgetting that yes. it's a, and like just like talking to it like it's there? Yes. And and poor Warren is like all day long he's in that thing and yeah. then at the end of the day he comes out. He's been interacting with actors all the time so he knows them. Yeah. But it's like they have they've no idea never seen him. So, yeah. so like when I transition to the face I got to let go of your hand. Just be as light as possible just so I can kind of Yeah. I'll be trying to like I'll hold you to me but as though I'm trying to Get rid of your hand. Okay. And then when the tail goes up, I'll take all my attention to that. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. And then I'll do that. Yeah. Awesome. This is adult corn. Yep. Uh, in its body armor. Yes. This is its EV suit. Its EV suit. Okay. Extra vehicular suit. Okay. This is its spacesuit. Talk to me about this remarkable piece of art. So this was a design over Warren, our suit performer in Canada. We had him scanned up there, mm -hmm. and. Um, we really wanted it to follow the shape of some of the, what's going on inside there without revealing it. Mm -hmm. Part of the whole appeal of what we've been doing from season one to season two is just slowly, you know, hinting at and not fully revealing the Gorn. It, and this, all of it, is about 100 pounds? Uh, what you're, the head is the about 100 head pounds. The head is, yeah, Warren wears this fiberglass chest that supports the, the head and neck. Yeah. And then his head is, is hidden inside here. Um, this is actually where he sees out of. Okay. Like we talked about before, you have to give him as much vision as possible yeah. as he's maneuvering around this bombed out ship yeah. and being hung upside down and yeah. all this wire work that he's got to do. He needs yeah. to be able to see. Wire work in this. Yeah. That's going to be a pass for me. <laughs> <laughs> wire work's bad enough. Yeah. Wire work in this. Oh, my God. It's heavy. And, um, and then you add on to it that you start to get 
compressed when you start getting lifted because it's anti-gravity. The whole sequence yeah. is anti-gravity. Yeah. He's on wires the entire time. That's that's bonkers. Yeah, because you just always needed that zero G movement. Yeah. Uh, we were setting up the shot, and I was admiring the gloves, and you pulled one I off. Pulled do one I pulled one off. Do I get to try one on? Yeah. So, so part of what we did, again, this, some of this is necessity that becomes canon. Okay. And since this is an alien EV suit, we took some liberties with, like, well, that's armored uh -huh. and covered in a way. But it's like it didn't make any sense just to have it there. So we started repeating that. Repeated so it here in the abdomen, yeah. it's in the shoulders, and the elbows. All of these areas that required more movement, yeah. that would be, like, their tactical stuff okay that's still environmentally safe but yeah. it's not armored so that was the language of that we put in the legs and we put everyone we put it in the gloves but <laughs> worn or cool. these and there's they're light and flexible yeah they actually they are oh this is soft yeah okay. yeah because he's got to grab stuff and this actually goes underneath here all right so there's no thumb so i'll just pull these over one at a time there you go got it okay A okay. bit too tight on the back here. But. All right. And now these are made for Warren, and then this would okay. snap over the top. And this was the last thing that we would do for Warren because, and one of the first things that we would take off. But that's basically it. And whoa, armored finger extensions that just look threatening yeah. and larger than you know, much larger than your hand, so that when it comes up on Spock, you know, it, it's like it could crush him. I am barely moving my fingers at all to make that happen. Oh my God, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> this feels like a great place to end this segment. <laughs> can you do the Vulcan one? I can almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, live long and prosper, nerds. <laughs> In this week's episode, the Enterprise crew meets future chief engineer Montgomery Scott, better known as Scotty for the first time. In what Star Trek The Next Generation episode does the crew of the Enterprise-D also have their first encounter with the legendary miracle worker? Relics? Rascals? Force of nature? Or homeward? The answer is relics. After discovering a crashed starship named the USS Janolan, the Enterprise-D crew learned Scotty survived the ship's accident by holding his pattern in the ship's transporter buffer for nearly 80 years. Once rematerialized, Scotty works with Geordi LaForge to prevent the Enterprise from meeting the Janolan's fate. It has been an absolute pleasure and such a privilege to dive into strange new worlds with you this season. Thank you to J. Allen Scott and our friends at Legacy FX for a very fun peek behind the curtain. And from the bottom of my heart, an enormous thank you to everyone from the cast who made time for us and you in between seasons to share their insights and experiences behind the scenes. They do not have to come here and do this. And I think it's important you know that they choose to be here. And I am so grateful. We're gonna close our hailing frequencies for a little bit, take some well-deserved shore leave. We will be back in the ready room later this year for Star Trek Lower Decks, and I cannot wait. You have no idea. Until then, I'm Will Wheaton. Live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs>